Hi, Sophia. Hi, Annabelle. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I am fabulous, even in the middle of my night. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're joining us all the way from New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, it's what, 2 a.m. your time? It's 2 a.m. my time, dead in the middle of the night, but I had to show up. Yes, you showed up and you showed out because you look beautiful. As you do too. You look fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Okay. Love it. Well, I'm in order. I'm going to have to do accessories, to dress you. Now. I'm sure you recognize all of this. I do. Each single piece comes to mind very specially. Yeah. Yeah, so I would like you to walk us through this. Why did you start this brand, Ada Alamo? What exactly does that mean? What does it represent to you? Um, sort of walk us through um, what this brand is all about. So I'll start with who I am. I am Dr. Sophia Omoro. I am Kenyan, but living abroad uh, mostly. Um, I joke with people that the TSA people in both countries usually know me because they say, oh, you're coming through again. I come back and forth quite often. I am, I am a doctor, I'm a surgeon, I'm a head and neck surgeon. That's my my day-to-day, um, -day, very consuming, all-consuming uh, profession and calling and job. Um, I currently work in the US, I work in Ohio, um, and I'm able to do all the other things that I do because I, I figured out early on that I needed to not work harder, but I needed to work smarter. I needed to be smart about what I was doing, just very mindful about my hours and my day so I could do all these other things that I truly feel I was called upon to do. So in a nutshell, I left Kenya when I was 15, green, uh, not knowing where in the world I was going, put on a plane and told go and do good. But I actually knew since about age 12 that I, I wanted to be a doctor. I knew I wanted to be a surgeon. Um, I was fixing chicken legs in the village all the time that were broken, it's hilarious. <laughs> so so that part of me, I think, came with my, my being. That's, God gave me that. And, and walking what I call my path opened all these doors that have led me to where I am. Mm -hmm. Yes. So a doctor, which is this sort of scientific pursuit, I'm assuming. Um, yeah. And at the same time, and you're a doctor in the States, and at the same time, you're a fashion designer here at home in Kenya. Now, how do those things kind of, how, how do they work together? <laughs> I, I, I feel that we all have a capability. I really do. I think that we, we all can harvest both sides of the brains. Um, I know time is, is a factor and family situations and opportunities, but I really do feel that all of us have it in us, you know, and what holds most people back is perhaps a fear or a doubt or a fear of being seen as an overachiever, a fear of being seen as something. And for me, a few things happened in life that made me just want to go for it, all of it. You know, we have this one life to live and only one. And how will you live it? And at the end of it, if you happen to have an opportunity to pause and look back, will you be able to tick all those boxes that say, I did it all? So a few things, including some um, losses in life came, came my way. And I just decided, you know what? I will do it all. So there are four main things that I feel that I'm called to do. Um, this uh, being a fashion designer is one of uh, one of those. I'm a girl. I'm a very girly you girl. Are. You're a very girly girl. I'm a tomboy. So that's probably where we differ. Are you really? But look at you looking so fabulous, the girly girl in a dress. But I'm wearing sneakers. <laughs> I, I, I come back to why I started this brand to begin with. You know, people ask me, to, to spit out the usual things that most brands spit out about your brand. Is it sustainable? Is it ethical? And those are such easy words to just throw yeah. around now. Is it made in Kenya? Is there a label on there that may, that is made in Kenya? For me, before I uttered those words, I wanted to be sure that I was truly and genuinely authentic. I was truly made in Kenya by Kenyan hands for Kenyans and beyond inclusive you know so i wanted to be really authentic to to all those things i talk about talking of sustainability you know odaomo we make super super small batches not because we want to exclude anyone but because we don't want to leave a big footprint and most of our things are byproduct 
or rejected fabric. It's those things that otherwise would go into that carbon landfill or would make someone work in situations that they shouldn't work for just to make my clothing. And if I had to do this thing of creating clothing that fit, look, and mean something, what better place to do in that back home where there's so much talent, there's so much amazing ability, creativity, plus I could support people and give jobs back. It was a no brainer. So we're here because you can see this conversational series called Beyond the Beautiful Things. And the premise of the series is talking about how fashion is more than just the things that we put on our bodies to cover up or, you know, to stunt. Fashion um, is really important in the sense that it can have value. You know, it can make us feel certain emotions, the way they're made, um, who makes them. Um, these things all have social value and some, some kind of importance. Um, I'm going to let you elaborate on that because you're the expert, you're the designer. Sort of tell us how African design can be not just beautiful, but valuable. So the, the idea came to me during this, you know, we can't ignore the pandemic is still here with us. It's affecting um, us in, in ways that we never thought for lengths of time that we never thought that we would be in it. Um, a very core of existence is literally threatened. You know, many people have lost their lives. Many people are losing their lives. Families are breaking down. And then here we are with fashion, you know. So in my mind, uh, it made me dig even deeper as to why is fashion relevant beyond just covering yourself. People are dying. I don't know about my job and I don't know whether my kids can go to school. Why should I care? And you alluded to the fact that, you know, fashion matters. First of all, it's one of the biggest footprints we can have and leave behind us on this earth, literally. We've heard it said over and over again, you know, be careful and mindful of what you wear. And now it seems like our very planet, this, this ground that we're trying to survive on is just heaving and writhing in pain as though someone's harmed it and it's now coming back well is fashion one of those ways that we might have harmed the planet or we could have harmed the planet if we haven't yet so is it the type of person that is getting over consumed is the type of fashion that is is harming another human being or taking from another substantive human being literally to clothe you as an individual. And this is the time for us to think about those things. And then there's also the other aspect of, of, of fashion that is um, neglected. It's part of your self-care. You know, here I am wearing wearing my very girly, girly, frilly, uh, frou-frou-y thing right now, but it makes me feel fabulous. It makes me feel right now that I can talk to you and I can talk to the world. And across from me in Kenya, you're wearing um, the dress that I made in the collection called Silaha with the thought of what are those things that give us bodily armor, subconsciously or consciously. And so fashion goes deeper than that. And more than ever, I wanted to start a conversation that is rarely, rarely addressed as to what you wear actually matters in multiple, multiple layers. So you're touching on heritage, you're talking about tradition, you're talking about um, a long heritage of a certain way we Africans have of expressing ourselves through what we wear, through our fabrics, through texture, through color. Now how does all that stuff, um, how is that relevant to the Odaomo brand or African fashion in general? I think as, as Kenyans in general, but as Africans, um, specifically, our cloth and clothing is so vital to who we are. Right. You know, the other day, I saw, yes, I saw a map of Africa where someone had put forth the different uh, fabrics manufactured in different countries. It's just amazing and so identifiable to that particular people that we lose that in chasing something other than that. And then I really wanted to stay true to my culture. I'm Luo, <laughs> just like you are. And um, we, we found out recently that my great-great-grandmother was actually a Kipsigis captured into Luo land, hence my love for all the Maasai type things. So I really, really wanted to stay true to that. 
I mean, so what you're describing, especially in this space that we're in, this sort of post-COVID space where, you know, it feels like there's a shift in ideology where we can't just sort of purchase things, um, you know, unconsciously without, you know, sort of thinking about what that purchasing decision is going to do for, you know, our communities or for the environment or for the people around us. It feels like you're saying fashion is almost a form of activism actually think it is an activism. There is power in, in buying particular, you know, products um, that are designer items. Absolutely. You know, my, my brand, uh, most people categorize as, as a luxury brand, perhaps, and, and I embrace that um, because of the way the garments are made. You know, the, the ruffles that you're wearing were actually done by hand. It wasn't machine and they were cut a certain way to fall a certain way. Yeah. It takes human hours and those hours should be recognized and compensated appropriately. Because I always say the one resource that you can never renew on this earth is your time. And so why should I, as a brand owner or a consumer, devalue your time? Right, I think a lot of times consumers don't see you know, the process. They don't understand, you know, from, from inception to it hanging in the store, how many hands have actually touched that garment? You know, how many ideas have gone into it? Where the fabric has come from? So there's this whole value chain um, that we really need to consider. I agree. And most of those garments that are touched by multiple hands end up being more durable and therefore it's an investment piece not in the traditional sense that we think that, oh, I'm buying it so I can sell it later at a, at a higher yeah. price, but investment for you as, as the purchaser. It yeah. will last you longer. It will take you more places than if you just go buy here and there for each event that you, you need to buy something for. Right. Um, now, as we wrap up, I mean, we could talk about this all day, Sophia, but I would just like to understand um, for your brand, Odaoma, what do you see, where do you see your brand going um, in this, you know, fraught atmosphere that we're in right now? That's, that's a tough question because we're all still standing on a very shifty um, ground with COVID. But one of the reasons I wanted to do this was to not only challenge myself, but everybody else as to, is this your pivoting point in life? Is this where you shift and, and redo? You know, nature has given you a very rare chance of rebooting. You know, you, you could exit stage left, I always say that, or you could stay on the stage, or you could exit and come back a brand new, uh, more meaningful, more valuable, more relevant um, uh, human being, brand, company. And so for Oda Omo, that's where, that's where um, I want to take the brand. You know, my, my team members will always tell you that my mantra to them is, number one, keep marching on. You have to keep marching on. And number two, this fashion platform that we all love and adore and, and look good in is only a platform. I tell them, what are we going to do on that platform that's actually going to shift or make a change? globally, starting with your own family, then your community, then your country. What are you going to do on this beautiful platform that we have? And so I, I see Odaomo as number one, enduring and coming out, you know, okay on the other side of things whenever and however that is, but coming out stronger with a new voice, but also having inspired anyone who's watching this, but my fellow creatives, especially in my industry, to, to just look at themselves and see where we can shift um, and make our designs as Africans really more relevant if they haven't been, and make a change in our community first. Stay within and do something for our people. Because the time that we needed people to help from outside or people could have helped, they were busy helping themselves, which is fine, but we need to be there for ourselves in every form. Dr. Sophia, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you for your time. And thank you for giving us this platform that we can you know, have these honest, very earnest conversations about who we are and where we need to go. Thank you. You, you, you give me life doing this and walking with me. And I can't say again, thank you for walking with me and trusting me with this very, very challenging um, project because we will cover a lot of very difficult um, 
deep and hard topics. Absolutely. Thank you, doctor. Stay safe out there and we'll talk soon. Stay safe, everyone, and see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Okay.